where we find ourselves today, and as we're recording this, 2022, you know, we've seen a lot in the last few years. And when you look at these younger generations that we just mentioned, millennials and Gen Z particularly, all they've ever known is, you know, globalization and technology and being instantly connected to the world. They're living in a time where Christianity is not the majority. On average, you're gonna find 70% of people in America who say, oh, I'm a Christian. But guess what? About a third out of that 70% are actual biblical Christians. Welcome everyone to Renew Your Mind. We're on podcast number 108 and we uh, have our guest speaker, Jason Jimenez, um, who is an author and he is the founding uh, director of Stand Strong Ministries. Um, we also have our pastor, Paul Gruenberg, our senior pastor at the First United Methodist Church in Gaylord, and myself, Dana Hall, as the moderator. Um, and we just wanna welcome Jason again. This will be his second year that he's coming to Gaylord um, just about a year ago in September. So we're really excited to have him back as a speaker. We we had a lot of interest in him uh, in his speaking the first or last year. So again, we're very excited. Um, so Jason, you want to tell us a little bit about your background and um, maybe how you got started? Um, I don't know. I'll just leave it to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, again, it's good to be with you guys, Pastor Paul and, and Dana. I appreciate you guys having me back on and look forward to being with you and your congregation, your community. Very lovely people. Uh, there. And uh, so I'm excited to be back with you guys as we continue some apologetic training and some good doctrinal you know, discussions that we could be having as we're equipping the families. So really in a nutshell, I think my background, I was raised Catholic in Arizona, Tucson, Arizona. My dad, uh, Hispanic and my mom from the Midwest. So they're polar opposites. My mom was raised Southern Baptist. My dad was kind of a nominal Catholic, um, but we were all sprinkled and you know, we're involved to some extent in our younger years in the Catholic church. But thankfully in the late eighties, there was a revival that was breaking out among a lot of the Hispanic community. And my dad went to it because his oldest sister got saved. She came to Christ and she came to the him and his family and many of our cookout, you know, events that we would have. And she began to share Christ. And so uh, my dad started to take that new faith and he started to invest in his boys. I grew up with four brothers. And uh, and when my mom died, though, unfortunately, she was taken when I was 15. She was killed in a car accident. And that really awakened my love for God because in that pain, if there was one person I tell this to people and I share my testimony, if there was one person in my life that brought comfort to me uh, in my worry, in my concern, or just had a way to soothe my soul. And also someone that I looked up to and I trusted was my mom. And so losing that anchor in my life caused me to really turn to the Lord. Now, my mom prophetically always said that she saw a calling in my life. And she said specifically as a pastor. And now, I mean, again, 12, 13, 14, even when I was 15, the year she died, she was telling me that regularly, but I loved basketball. I was very competitive, very driven, and I wanted to go to the University of Arizona. And so my, when my mom would say that, I didn't disregard and think that she was being foolish, but it was actually when she did die, I started to go back and review in my mind those type of prophetic statements. And it was actually at her funeral which was my first kind of public little sermonette that I gave. They carved out like a 12 minute slot for me to share. And God used pastors to come alongside me after that funeral that I gave at my mom, you know, my mom's funeral and started to say, you know, you have a gift. So that's what I started to pursue. And I became a junior high director when I graduated high school. And that when I was going to college and I was working in the, in the local student ministry and fell in love with it. And then my wife and I got married in 2001 and uh, we took over the family ministry. So we were doing children's ministry, student ministry. But along the way, I started to become more engaged with parents who were coming to me with questions, whether it be about the Bible or you know raising a millennial uh, or they were coming from a different faith. And I knew I was always drawn to that sort of thing, apologetics, theology, whatever. And so I wanted to really go deeper, but really in Tucson, Arizona, the only thing that I had at the time was studying philosophy at a secular 
college. So I wanted to pursue more training in Christian apologetics. So we packed up our bags in 2006. My wife and I had two small kids at the time. Now we have four. My oldest is in college now. But at the time, Tyler, my oldest, was three years old. And we moved all, we moved from Arizona to North Carolina. And so since then, I was a part of a big mega church, about 5,000 members, ran the family student ministry and was going to seminary. And I was personally trained by Dr. Norman Geisler for almost 15 years before he passed away and got to do ministry with him, write a book with him. And he was the one that saw the next chapter in my ministry. And he felt that I was called to lead the local church after doing that for 16 years, working with families. And he said, you're called to be kind of like the next generation of Christian apologists with a pastoral heart to minister to families. And you know what? That really spoke to me because he was one of the main reasons why my wife and I moved to Charlotte. So he not only became my professor, but he also became a personal colleague and mentor. And so since now, it's almost been 25 years now since I've been doing full-time ministry. And uh, most of that's been helping Christian families uh, understand what they believe and why they believe it. Wow. First of all, you don't look old enough to be in ministry for 25 years, Jason. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) But yeah. It's the lotion. It's the lotion that I use. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. And I'm I'm glad you took us back through that because I had forgotten... uh, some of the things that you had mentioned. Um, yeah, especially your mentorship uh, with with Dr. Norman Geisler. I mean, uh, I like what you said, professor and mentor, and I'm sure a friend. And he mm-hmm. saw in you what, what maybe you didn't yet. Um, well, that's... Um, that's really... That's really awesome. Um, I guess... I know. Um, is there anything you want us you want to tell us about Stand Strong Ministries? Um, I know that's. Uh, I don't remember when you started that up. You know, after I know it's based out of North Carolina. But anything, what led you to start that ministry? Yeah, so we launched it in 2012, 12, and obviously okay. the first like two years was just trying to figure out, you know, what this nonprofit ministry was going to look like after leaving. You know, being involved in the local church for 16 years, I'd never written a book. You know, I wasn't traveling like in different areas other than, you know, just the ministry that I, I, God had called me to in in the local church ministry to families Mm -hmm. and the programs that we ran. Um, So it it took us a while to figure out the networks of those kind of things and, you know, and what our mission was, was ultimately going to be. We had an idea uh, in, and so stand strong ministries and obviously the name, it's a biblical term, right? We see repeatedly in scripture to stand firm, to stand strong, uh, in your faith, to be brave, right? To be courageous. And we, we have, we're in an era where there's so many Christians. They may not have, they may not be rejecting their faith. And, you know, in a sense, but they definitely have a dejected faith. And that's my passion. I really, the space that Stan Strong Ministries lives in is not directly the atheist, though we get a lot of people who are atheists or agnostic or skeptics that watch my videos, listen to podcasts or read my books. But our primary space are Christians who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They believe the Bible to be true, but they may not know why entirely that is the case. Like, why is the Bible the inspired word of God? I believe it to be the case, but if somebody were to ask me, you know, do you believe that there is a God? What responses do they give? Uh, Do you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? You know, or somebody says, you know, with that classic objection that, you know, Jesus didn't exist. You know, how, you know, so they object to that or Jesus did exist. He was a Galilean prophet in the first century. Supposedly he performed miracles, but this idea that he rose from the dead is not true. How do you respond to that as a Christian? Because without the resurrection, there is no Christianity according to first Corinthians 15. So that's the space that I live in. My heart was to come alongside Christians and help them be strong in their faith and not feel dejected. Uh, and so what we do is we, there's a three-step process and this helps anybody, no matter where they're at in their faith, old or young. Okay. You could be a newborn Christian, or you could be someone who's been faithfully walking with Christ for 60 years. Number one is we seek to embolden you guys. The key thing is, and pastor Paul, you know, this, there are so many people 
who uh, just feel embarrassed or they just, again, they feel so dejected. And so be, before I train people in content, I look to embolden them to build mm-hmm. confidence in their life through the power of the Holy Spirit. Number two, then we equip. So we embolden, then we equip them with whatever content is necessary. So like with you guys, go there and teach them on, you know, uh, this is what's happening in our culture, you know, whether it be post-modernity, whether it be, you know, people who are progressive in their faith and they're claiming that the Bible is not the infallible word of God and that truth changes and that Jesus can be whoever you think he is in your mind because he's just won the self-consciousness of the world. You know, how do you equip Christians to respond to those type of spiritual beliefs that actually go contrary to the Bible? And then number three is then take what you have learned and go engage, go into the world, be a light, be a witness. And so that's what we try to help people through Stand Strong Ministries. And so I would say this, that the primary audience are people that do attend a church and they want to be more grounded in their faith Mm -hmm. as parents, raising the next generation. So yes, we deal a lot with parents who are raising millennials and Gen Z and are being inundated with this sexual revolution that we're seeing of people transitioning from one gender to the next or to the other. Uh, people that are saying that there is a gay gospel, uh, people that are saying that uh, you could be progressive as a Christian. That means like deny the virgin birth, deny that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, deny the resurrection, deny the second coming and still be a Christian. So those are the things that we deal with as a ministry. So uh, Jason, you're, you're throwing out some terms there that people might be unfamiliar with. For instance, what's the age group of millennials? What's the age group of Gen Z? Yeah, that's a good question. So millennials really start after 1983 to about 2000. So, you know, the oldest millennial now is going to be edging into their forties. Okay. Um, And Gen Z starts at 2000, you know, some people in sociology, they tend to factor in generations based on a catastrophic event or something that was very life-changing. So, you know, so, you know, right at that era and then into a new millennial uh, period, if you will, uh, you have, and then you had 9-11. So that, that's right. Gen Z. And so now Gen Z uh, are graduating college. So the oldest are graduating college now, but the vast majority of college students today uh, consist of Gen Zers. And so you'd think, well, what's, what's after that? Well, the generation of plurals, or now they're referring to them as COVID kids because of what we have faced with or masked kids, again, because of a catastrophic event that really defines a particular generation. Uh, so right now, when you when you take the population in America, they consist mainly of millennials, Gen Z, and generation plurals. Hmm. I haven't so heard ba- that so, yet. Yeah, so, yeah. Gen, so Gen X, which is my generation, is from 1964, again, to 1982, right? And before that is the baby boomers. So, you know, let's, let's apply that then to parenting and grandparenting. Gen Z actually is being raised by baby boomers, Gen X and millennials. And the reason for that is because a lot of people are having kids later in life or have been remarried. And so even if they didn't, they don't have children together they have children from previous relationships. So there's a lot of co-parenting and step-parenting among the millennial and Gen Z generation. Well, something else you had mentioned in regard to uh, just the embolden, equip, and engage. Uh, You're talking in terms of working with people who have already made a decision for Christ at some level. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, really interesting things uh, in regard to that is the culture around us. And and what you're saying in regard to believers is not something that's really new. Uh, The culture had shifted in the 40s, 50s to a very Christian, from a very Christian culture to a very then 60s, 70s, 80s, um, 60s was empowered. Uh, uh, living a lifestyle that was um, free, I guess, for lack of better words, uh, the sexual revolution then. And then uh, we move into the 80s, the me generation, 
this is, in my perspective, is a cycle that continually goes on and on and on. And uh, when you talk in terms of needing to reach out to believers who are maybe less informed about uh, the Bible or Jesus or how their faith should be played out in the world, um, that's not something new. Uh, You've talked about uh, a particular group of people who are uh, maybe hijacking the Bible. You talk about a gay gospel. Um, Those are new things. Talk a little bit, uh, just address that in regard to this battle that Christianity has always had uh, with the culture. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question, Paul. I mean, like my new project I'm working on right now, the reason I put different layers to it is because, to your point, I want people to understand that where we find ourselves today, and as we're put, you know recording this, 2022, um, you know, we've seen a lot in the last few years. And when you look at younger, these younger generations that we just mentioned, millennials and Gen Z particularly, you find that all they've ever known is terrorism. You know, Mm -hmm. all I've ever known is, you know, globalization and technology and being instantly connected to the world. Um, So they see things in an an instant. They're they're actually living in a time now, if you think about this, and I'm raising four Gen Zers uh, and my wife and I, we we talk a lot about this with other family members, you know, and friends who are raising kids, you know, in this generation that um, they're living in a time where Christianity is not the majority. Now, again, let's be frank. Mm-hmm. On average, you're going to find 70% of people in America who say, oh, I'm a Christian. But guess what? About a third of that 70% are actual biblical Christians, meaning right. doctrinally they believe. Yeah, there's a huge difference. Between I mean, believing in God and being a Christian. Right. And now in, in America today, most people, when you ask them, are you a Christian? They believe, well, I I believe there was a person named Jesus. I do believe there's a supernatural power that exists. I don't know maybe what it is, but I do believe I have spiritual beliefs. So that they associate Christianity to that. And so in their mind, that's what a Christian is. Mm-hmm. And that's, so that's startling. So the point is, even Paul, when you, you got, you and Dana were growing up, Christianity, uh, even, even in the sexual revolution, like you said, there, there was a huge presence of Christianity that really influence how you market it to kids, uh, emphasis of family values, holding to a Judeo-Christian ethic, upholding to how this this country, this great country of ours was founded, maybe not as a Christian nation, but certainly with a Christian heritage. There were still prayer in schools, right? Uh, there was there were still, you know, uh, a huge presence with dads Um and in and, and, uh, churches being built around communities or communities being built around churches, I should say. Now, that is not the case with our generation today. And so what's significant, though, is when you look at Christians now, and a lot of them get scared when they see, get afraid if if you brought a Bible to, 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 to work, um, if you're not you know, bowing down to the Black Lives Matter movement, if you are not putting a, a rainbow flag on your desk, um, you know, those type of things. And I remind people, look, when you go back to early days of Christianity and, you know, the early years in the first and and going to the second century, all they ever knew was persecution. They had Gnosticism to deal with. And then after that was other movements that, you know, ran contrary to the teachings that Jesus taught or that he was half man, half God. He wasn't fully God or fully man. There's always been movements that we have seen that Christianity has had to debate against or stand against or oppose. And that's where apologetics comes from is you know, apologetics at the heart of it. And this is what the apostles did. I mean, John, the apostle, the one who lived the longest out of all of them, who was not martyred, eventually died, but wrote five books of the Bible, right? The gospel, John, three epistles in the book of Revelation. He was arguing against a movement that was known as Gnosticism. And at the heart of it, they said, matter, right? In the physical world, matter is evil. Therefore, God, whatever God is, right? To the Gnostic person, God could not inhabit or manifest a physical nature because that would make God evil. 
Therefore, Jesus could not have been God in the flesh. So they deny the incarnation right off the bat. Okay, that was already hitting the early church before the gospels had ever been written. Okay. And so the point being today, we're dealing with a lot of progressive Christianity, people who in many ways, Paul, believe the same thing in these Gnostics were believing 2000 right. years ago. And I remind Christians that because this isn't, like you said, it may have a new face. It may have a new website. Okay. There may be new leaders, new books that are coming out, but they're saying the same stuff that we've been dealing with for years. So we should not be alarmed and freak out like, oh my gosh, you know, how do we respond now when people are denying the resurrection? Oh my gosh, how should we, you know, we're freaking out because people are saying the Bible isn't true, that it's been concocted and it's been filled with a bunch of errors and it was hijacked years ago in the church and they wanted a certain leader that was the head of it or the symbol of it. And, and that's why you have, you know, the canonicity. That's why you have 66 books of the Bible as opposed to 130. And they freak out, like, how do we respond to these things? Christianity, historic Orthodox Christianity, what I refer to in a nutshell, biblical Christianity, has always been under attack by, by the culture. And, and so when we see what's happening today with cancel culture, we shouldn't be surprised, number one, right? Right. We shouldn't be shocked. And, and last, let me just say this. We shouldn't be fully troubled to where then we just run for the hills. I say instead, and this is what Dr. Geyser taught me. He says, anytime you see a false teaching out there being perpetrated or propagated by a false teacher. So it's a huge movement. It's growing arms and in, 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 in acceptance, like gay pride stuff and how now people not, they don't just believe it, but they celebrate it. He says, think of it um, as a fire that's growing. What do you do? If you are truly a firefighter, you know, like you're some, someone who's looking to save people, you don't run away from the fire. You run to the fire and you look for ways to save people uh, from being burned or from death. And that's what happens when I see these worldviews that run contrary to the Bible. I see them as fires. And yes, they may, they may be uh, um, like right now, California has some, you know, some major fires going on. Right. And it takes a lot of uh, support from the government state, local level, um, as well as, uh, you know, um, volunteers to, to do what they need to do to put the fire out. Um, and, and a lot of times people need to be better educated or better warned. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing. And more importantly, when it comes to spiritual things is when think, when think, when Satan's setting things on fire, he's trying to destroy things. We need to be the Christians who are not running from the fire, but we're running to it to save lives and to put the fire out. And so we're just seeing some new uh, faces, but the same ideologies, the same worldviews, Paul, that right. we've been dealing with for years. That would be uh, going to the fire and pouring out living water mm -hmm. onto the fire, yeah. uh, giving the truth. Um, one of the things that uh, as a nation that we're, I guess, battling uh this whole idea that the United States was based on uh, the founding fathers uh, took that seriously and the structure of the United States government and, and just the people was based on Christian values. And yet we see ourselves as a, as a nation more so pulling away from that. And my question is, should we try to go back to what it once was? So the idea in a, in a very governmental area is, should we try to really push, we are a Christian nation, you know, you can go back, look at Supreme Court decisions early on, and you can see that they're just laced with Christian principles. And, um, and for the church, you know, you rightly so. We're told by Paul, we're told by the writers that there will be deceivers uh, that will uh, happen, that will come along. But should we try to go back to a, uh, a, a Christian nation, I guess, from some older folks that would look like the 50s, you know, where the church doors were open and everyone went to church on Sunday and there were no stores that were open. Uh, there were no games that were played. 
uh, should we really try to go back to that era or should we do something else? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good question. And that's something that I get often, especially uh, when we were on tour a few years ago, uh, my friend, Dr. Alex McFarlane, we wrote a book called Stan Strong America. Um, so let me, let me unpack a couple things because there, there is a lot there and I know we have limited time. Number one, let me say this. We were never a Christian nation to begin with. The founders, um, and I just was reading a book, uh, right? I have right here, actually, First Principles, What America's Founders Learned from the Greeks and Romans and How That Shaped Our Country. Now, Thomas Ricks is the writer of this book, but he unpacks the education, really the belief system of our founders. And what people have to understand, not that I agree with everything in this book, but what people have to understand is that a lot of the founders were not Christian to begin with. And the ones who were Christian, um, they all had different points of view denominationally, right? Which was actually a lot more strict and legalistic uh, because you couldn't buy, sell, or trade if you weren't a Calvinist. You couldn't buy, sell, or trade with a Calvinist if you were a Catholic. I mean, so when you see the developmental structure of our the early years of our country, um, I don't want to go back to that. Um, and that's the other thing is they were not trying, the ones who were biblically sound, like the Benjamin Rushes of the world, they were not trying to build a Christian nation. Now, the state issues, their state legislators had a particular belief religiously that was different right. on a federal level. So we can discuss that later. But still, when you collectively look at the colonies that became the early states under this new guise of the Constitution that was erected and signed into, into law, into federal law, they were not saying we are now a Christian nation. They were saying we have a Christian heritage. We believe in a natural law. We believe in natural order. We believe in a Judeo-Christian ethic. We believe in the Ten Commandments. We believe that there is a God who sent his son, who is the savior of the world. So we have that historically as an, and not just as our origin, but as a foundation to the early tenets of our, of our nation. Um, so let's, let's be clear there. So we're talking the difference between a Christian heritage and a Christian nation. Now, for some of those who are listening, who, uh, love our nation, as you said, Paul, and care deeply about it. I do not hold to several people who are quote unquote Christian, Dr. Gregory Boyd, who strongly is, is, is advancing a revisionist point of view with the, the, the role that Christianity played in America. So on one principle idea that I hold to with him is that we were not a Christian nation. So he's not arguing from that point of view, but what he does do is he separates the level that Christianity plays in America. David uh, French is another guy who's a very popular writer in the Christian space. And the other one is a guy named Dr. John Fay, who is a, an, an American historian. Um, and he had a, he wrote a book several years ago, was, was the United States a Christian nation? Was America a Christian nation? Um, so I don't maybe have, I don't come to the same conclusions those guys do, but I do think that when you look at the beauty in the, and the providential hand of God in America is very unique. But here's the thing. You see this biblically uh, and theologically. God, from the days of Israel, was never, when they went astray, he never said, okay, you guys got to get back to where you were 20 years ago. Right. He never did. So funny because oftentimes when we argue to do that, that's not really being led with wisdom according to scripture. Number two, I always ask the question, well, you must have done something wrong to where we're, why we've arrived to where we're at today. So if the fifties were so great, why did you, why did it turn into the 1960s and, 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 and no fault divorce and the wedlocks and, you know, government spending and funding for welfare, if it was so great, you know, we can't pinpoint a particular decade that was the best that we want to go back to. God has called us according to Acts 17, that he has put us where we are at, whether your nationality is American or it's Indian or, or, you know, some, some form of fashion of, of being, you know, from Europe, we are designed by God to be in place where we are at. And so the circumstances that we find ourselves in, we don't try to go back in the past. We try to say, okay, what light or witness can we be today to transform tomorrow? That's right. our focus. And so, so this idea of trying to go back to a period of time when we as Christians are to look forward, right? And to look upward, 
That's our calling. And I pray that'd be something to help maybe people who've wrestled with that. Mm -hmm. So the culture has shifted, uh, Jason, over the last few years um, with the demonstrations and a lot of stuff going on as a nation. You've got some things like uh, deconstructing and wokeness. Uh, How does that impact uh, Christianity? Yeah, that's a good one. So I just was doing um, a call with a friend of mine who's writing a book on deconversions. And and in that, he talks about deconstruction. So let's just define the two. They're two different things. So deconstruction actually has more of a secular terminology from some philosophers, Derrida's, Heidegger's. And at the, at the heart of deconstructionism was um, that words don't have meaning. And you, it's almost like you redefine or you kind of produce your own truth in the end, right? So you deconstruct something and then you reconstruct it, okay? And hopefully in the reconstruction of deconstruction, right? That, and it's confusing, right? You're reconstructing what you deconstructed. It's almost like p- picture this. There's a model of Legos and you break them apart. So you have the pieces now and you just reconfigured into something other than what it was made to be, right? And it's almost like that's truth. Here's here's a hundred pieces of Legos. You you construct, you deconstruct. I give you a model that's built out of a hundred pieces of, of of Lego, and you deconstruct it to reconstruct an image that you want, a model that you want. And in essence, that's what truth is to someone who believes in deconstructionism. So you have a lot of Christians today who say that's a good thing. You know, deconstruct your faith and reconstruct. You know, some truer meaning. Well, the problem is that, the problem with that is that historically speaking and philosophically, that's not what the term has meant by these um, progressive philosophers like the Derrida's and the Heidegger's. They don't uphold to God, natural law, truth is absolute and objective, truth is relative, okay, which l- later led to postmodernity that you can basically um, prescribe to whatever you believe in your life, be whoever you want to be. Well, well, guess what that's resulted to? Now people are even changing their sex. They're saying that you were assigned maleism um, in the beginning, or they, they completely deconstruct the binary terminology of biological sex. See, that's what deconstructionism actually is. So when we start putting that into our faith, I think that we're getting our terminology mixed up. So I do not encourage people to be deconstructing their faith because it's a negative term from the beginning. What happens is Christians are late to the party. This is taken over culturally. And what Christians try to do is they try to rebrand it, right? They try to Christianize it. And that's not a good thing. And so we have to be careful with that. Now, when it comes to deconversions, this is somewhat different, but it, but it, but they're linked. And this is how, how it's linked. When someone who was raised in a Christian home, let's say, and let's say they quote unquote profess to know Christ as the Lord and Savior. And over time, they've been influenced by TikTokers and YouTuber people and an atheist professor and some atheist friends or their best friends gay and 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 saying, I've been liberated and Christianity is rigid and judgmental and harsh and condescending. And as I've been deconstructing my faith, I've come to realize. And so as a result of it, what have I done? I've deconverted, meaning in a nutshell, I've left the faith. I no longer believe what I was raised to believe. That was not my faith. That was my mom's or my dad's or both of theirs. So deconstruction can lead to someone deconverting or leaving the Christian faith. Okay. And we're seeing that. I mean, that is a huge conversation that a lot of us are having um, these days with deconstruction and deconversion. So they're not, they're not the same, but they are paired together. And we just have to understand what one means and the outcome of the other. So because of some deconstruction that's taking place, it's resulted by people deconverting, meaning leaving the faith. Okay. Now, a healthy version of that would be is what, what do you do when someone has doubts, when they have issues and they're struggling in their faith? That's different. That doesn't mean they're deconstructing their faith. Nowhere in scripture does it tell us to strip our faith down. 
Matter of fact, what we see in Second Peter chapter one is we are to add to our faith, not strip away our faith, okay? So even just the concept or the approach is wrong from the beginning. And that's why I do believe, Paul, in some cases, people were taught inappropriate ways to evaluate or examine their faith as 2 Corinthians 13, 5 tells us to do. And as a result of it, they're left with no substance or answers, nothing that's absolute or objective. There is no ultimate standard. And this, as a result of it, if you come out believing that God is just whatever imagination you believe him to be, that he's just this self-consciousness of the world, and we came by happenstance, and you buy into evolution, and the Bible is just filled with a bunch of bigotry, and Jesus was just this moral teacher, but he never rose from the dead, of course you're going to deconvert from that. Right. And, and, and so about- that's that's why we have to counter that, going back to those fires, we have to counter that boldly without apology. And that's what young people need. I don't apologize when I defend the inspiration and infallibility of scripture. I I don't apologize when I give evidence and proof historically of the resurrection. And and so deconversion is leading um, a lot of uh, people astray thinking that they've actually been liberated. And you know what they've also ultimately left? They ultimately left rigidity. They ultimately left a false version of Christianity or a moralistic one where it wasn't a personal God. It was more of a deistic God. And, 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 and from the get go, they've had a false narrative that they've grown up in. And that's what's led to a lot of these deconversions. And finally, let me say this. A lot of people have deconverted. They've actually just left being a part or associated with Christian stuff. They were never believers to begin with. And ah, guess what? We actually see that in writings of Paul and the apostle John talking about people who have been among us, but they're not of us. They were dealing with it in early Christianity, just like we're dealing with it today. So there's nothing new under the sun. So, you know, one of the aspects for our audience who might be listening, if you're a parent or a a grandparent, especially grandparents, because they they have a broader perspective, uh, more life experience underneath them is to not give up hope on your uh, child or your grandchild uh, or grandchildren um, that by, uh, and going back to that, pouring living water onto your children, your grandchildren, being a a solid uh, anchor for them to hang on to when they are battling the waves of the culture that want them to deconstruct or deconvert. Uh, Those are important uh, ways that we can play uh, to be that um, anchor for them to say, you know, I remember grandma or grandpa talking about, you know, Jesus in in really personal terms, how they just love Jesus. And then seeing in their own life how Jesus has been uh, kind of a shadow figure or the church has been, you know, hypocritical. The church has always been uh, hypocritical from age to age. I mean, that's just the reality. And you uh, non-Christians point to the church and say, I'll never be a part of that. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, that's like saying to people, I'll never go to the hospital until I'm on my deathbed, right? And the hospital's there, and it's got people in different stages of wellness, wholeness, uh, all see made whole again physically or even emotionally or mentally. And so we always keep that hospital at a arm's length when we should embrace, uh, in this case, the church and be a part of it in all of its uh, – Yeah craziness, I guess, for lack of better words. But if you're listening to this and you're a parent raising a Gen Z person, what can we expect uh, when you um, come and meet with the the parents of the Gen Z or grandparents of Gen Z uh, kids? Well, you know, one I just say right off the bat is, you know, there's there's still hope. I mean, this idea, Absolutely. like, I, I, th- I think what we've done with the millennial generation is, is we've spent so much time 
with what they were rejecting or turning away from what they were abandoning. And we're, we were desperately trying to win them back by giving them or, or compromising with what we felt they needed or they wanted. Well, a lot of that was because we babied so many of them, that generation, you know, they're, they're given awards left and right for nothing, for, you know, just participation awards type stuff. Um, and we've catered that to the millennial generation. And so when, a lot of them were up in arms over church things. Um, what did we do? Well, look at what we've produced a lot. We've produced a lot of celebrity pastors. Well, what's interesting is for Gen Z generation, they're more homebodies. Generation G Z is better educated in their early stages, more so than millennials were. There is a little bit more stability that's happening among Gen Z than we saw early on with millennials in the early 2000s. Um, Gen Z want more community and realizing that it didn't work with millennials. And so they don't want to see the fate in their own generation. There's more I can say to that, but what's important for us to understand is there is still hope. Gen Z, they want theology. Gen Z, they want, um, guidance. They want discipline. They want structure. Okay. They want things, and this is true for all generations, but I keep reinforcing this because we have this idea of thinking that, oh my gosh, Gen Z is, they're all just pluralistic, you know, and they all embrace same-sex marriage and all. And that may be the case, but that doesn't mean they're dogmatic about it. Right. And, and one of the things, uh, maybe we should, I know we need to wrap up soon, is that the Gen Z are being raised by millennials who were the ones who were kind of floating through life. How would you uh, talk with uh, the parents who are the millennials in regard to their own faith so that they can then begin to bolster the faith of their children? Yeah, so, um, and, and I agree that, that Gen Z is being raised in part by millennial parents, but the actual fact in my research in this new book called Parenting Gen Z, How to Navigate Your Child in a Hostile Culture, there are actually four categories of parents who are raising Gen Z. And that's what's significant. We're actually at a point in time with people listening, and I mentioned it briefly before, but there are a lot of different types and categories of parents raising Gen Z than ever before in American history. So think about that. Uh, and it's true, meaning I can have a friend of mine who's 66 years old, who's raising a 12 year old. Mm -hmm. And, and, and at the same time, having a millennial who's 28. Um, and single. And then you having parents like my wife and me married for 21 years with four kids and, and, um, you know, we're not divorced, but we're all raising Gen Z. Okay. Right. And, that, and, and, and you say, well, isn't, wasn't that true with millennials? Yeah. But not to the highest extent into the percentage of what we're seeing today. So let me just give you an example quick and I'll respond because this isn't just a, um, I'm not just speaking to a millennial who, uh, was, you know, born within the range of like, again, 1984 to 1992. The other ones would be from 93 to 1999. So here's what's significant to the parents who are listening. If you go back, let's go back a ways. And let's say you're, you're listening and you're an older Gen X parent from like 1964 to about 1972. Guess what? 40% in that category had a biblical worldview. Mm -hmm. And their pure responsibility is they were realists. They, so they're very objective. Okay. You work hard, you save money, you could buy a house. Okay. That's older Gen X. Now remember older Gen X came from broken families. They are the, really the generation we started seeing in America with broken families, right? The free sex we we're talking about. Um, but their, res their parenting style, they're very responsible. Okay. Well, when you start getting, Roe v. Wade was legalized in 1973 to when the millennials started to come on scene as babies in 1983. So that 10 year gap or time frame, I should say, the peer personality with younger Gen X were their idealists. Okay. So they are parenting from rejection. So I do not want my kids to be raised the way I was. Well, the worldview at this point now dropped 10%. So now only a third of parents in that demographic have a biblical worldview. Doesn't mean that half of them weren't Christian. They're just, a lot of them are just biblically illiterate. Um, and they're very dependable. Okay.
Okay. So they were very involved in their kids' lives. All right. But a lot of them got divorced, but they still maintain a relationship with their kids even after the divorce. Well, then you got millennials are on scene. Okay. From 1984 to 1992. And they become consumerists. So again, notice, notice what we're seeing this progression, Paul. We have realists 20 years removed from idealists to now consumerists. Now, a big part of that was technology, right? How we just transfer our attention or the way we go about life. Well, consumerist mentality, these parents now raising kids in America are raising from discontentment. They don't have enough. Mm -hmm. Right. They don't have enough. So they start judging their parenting on what their kids have or don't have. Guess where the worldview is at this point? 20%. And the parenting style now is being relatable. Okay. So they're always, yeah, they're always relating exactly with their kid. They're seeing their kid in these situations as they would see themselves. So they're responding in a relatable fashion, but out of a, a discontent attitude. Okay. It's never enough. And that's where the social media has done is you start placating to that, trying to show off a side of you in this imaginary, imaginary space. And these parents, um, they're the ones that, um, uh, go on social media and they just throw out their dirty laundry for the world to see. And it's very immature and disrespectful. Not all of them. But you see this huge increase of that more than you've ever seen in previous generations of parents. The last demographic now raising Gen Z are the younger millennials. And most of them have children out of wedlock or, or cohabiting. They are narcissistic and they parent from fear. So you have realists, idealists, consumerists, and narcissists. Their worldview is at 12% and their parenting style is very agreeable. They don't discipline. So what I, what, what they've done and many of them who are single parents, they work out, they compromise, they work out something that will make their child happy. And that's what they want. They want their child to be safe and they want their child to be happy. So they are always agreeable with how their child expresses themselves. And as a result, guess what we're seeing? Predominantly within the demographics of parents who are younger Gen X, older millennials, and younger millennials, that generation that's now raising some Gen Z, as well as the plurals, the next generation since 2016 now, so they're about five, six years old. Guess what What we're seeing now on that's being publicized on newscasts or on YouTube channels or podcasts is these are the parents that when they have a child, they don't give them a sex. They say in time, they will determine their own sex, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the progression. So let me just say this. And that's why it's hard to address parents of Gen Z because they're so convoluted with a lot of difference of style of parenting, worldview, understanding, et cetera. Let me just say from all the people listening that are raising someone who's like no older than 22 years old and no younger than 10, you have to discipline your child. You have to be consistent and authentic. Mm -hmm. And the one way to do that is you have to model the faith and be consistent with what you say and how you behave. Because what has devastated millennials and Gen Z is the total hypocrisy that they've seen at home as well as in the church. And we have become so normalized with divorce that it's become an accepted practice. But guess what? Every family, every family is unique and it's a personal experience for every single family. And I have now at this stage of my career have counseled thousands upon thousands of young people. And one of the number one things that they tell me was my parents divorced. And that was if they love God and the Bible opposes divorce, all that kind of stuff, like why would they do that? Now there's again, a million reasons why, but the point is, is a lot of them are coming off with a lot of hurt and rejection. And what do they throw that onto? They, they associate or throw that onto God. And so there's a lot of forgiveness that needs to take place. So what I tell parents is like, you got to discipline, you got to be structured, you got to model your faith, but parent with grace and be vulnerable enough to take on their challenges and their questions without being degrading 
or argumentative, but feed into that space more regularly and don't assume for them. Don't assume you know how they feel. Let them express how they feel. And if they're in along the process when they're telling you that and they may be kind of be scolding you, it's not time for you to say, shut your mouth, don't talk to me that way. Maybe the pain they're experiencing is a result of your inconsistency or your hypocrisy. And that's what we need to be doing more to work these things out. Now, again, that's that doesn't solve everything. But I'm just trying to help parents to understand the, the approach so that way we can get further down the line with these kids rather than disrupt that vulnerability and then end any future conversation with them. Hmm. That's great, Jason. Um, we are <clears throat> getting to the end of the podcast, but I just wanted to remind our listeners that Jason will be speaking um, on the Parenting Gen Z Saturday, September 17th from 3 to 5 p.m. Um, so we really encourage anyone that wants to hear more of what Jason has begun to speak about and equipped us, equip each of us with different um, tools and things of that nature, please join us during that time. Um, also on Friday, September 16th, he's going to be speaking on hijacking Jesus. And then on Saturday evening, uh, should cr uh, Christians be woke? And that's on the 17th from 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. So we're super excited to have to hear more from Jason. We really appreciate his time today. We appreciate Pastor Paul's time. Um, and just encourage everybody to come join us during the special weekend that Jason's going to make this trip to Gaylord, Michigan. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.